Well, I'd like to go ahead and get started uh, today. Our panel is charged with exploring the links between family economic stability um, and strong, strong social relationships, including marriage. And of course, I think everyone here knows that a large body of research tells us that stable marriage, uh, stable marriages are linked to better outcomes for kids, for families, and for communities. Melissa Kearney's work tells us that kids are less likely to end up poor and more likely to be flourishing in school if their parents are married. My own work with Wendy Wong shows us that millennials are more likely to avoid poverty if they put marriage before childbearing. And Raj Chetty's work tells us that stable families at the community level are linked to greater economic mobility for poor children and to a smaller gap in economic mobility uh, between black boys and white boys uh, across the life course. Uh, but just because marriage is good for children, for families and communities, doesn't mean that everyone should get um, and stay married or that we can just rely on exhortation to encourage more stable families. We need to confront the economic, the civic, and the cultural barriers out there when it comes to forging strong and stable marriages. We also need to reform public policies, in my view, that penalize marriage today, particularly for working class families. And we need to explore policies that can help us to strengthen um, our family relationships, including marriage. To help us address these issues, we have an A-level group of scholars today joining us um, to my left. Uh, to my immediate left, we have Jennifer Silva, who is an assistant professor of sociology at Bucknell University. She earned a PhD from UVA and completed a postdoc at Harvard. Her first book, Coming Up Short, Working Class Adulthood in an Age of Uncertainty with Oxford, examines the transition into adulthood for working class youth. And her current book project is We're Still Here, Pain and Politics in the Heart of America, which examines working class people's political beliefs and behaviors in the coal region of northeastern Pennsylvania. Obviously very topical. Uh, and then Scott Winship, uh, just further down the table here, has been recognized as a leading economics researcher on poverty, inequality, and economic mobility, and has testified multiple times up on Capitol Hill. He currently directs the Social Capital Project for Senator Mike Lee in the Joint Economics Committee of Congress. And previously, Scott was a fellow at the Brookings Institution, among other places, and has received his PhD in social policy from Harvard University. Hayden Kerban, to my far left, is a professor in economics at Harvard University, sorry, Howard University, with interests in urban and regional economics, in local education redistribution, and in the economics of disasters. He is the co-author, among many other publications, of a permanent jobs program for the US, economic restructuring to meet human needs, and he holds a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Chicago. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the, the podium here um, to Professor Silva. Thank you for this opportunity. So I'm going to open our panel on social relationships and family stability and well-being with a case study from my latest research on struggling families in rural Pennsylvania. So this is the life story of Bree, who's a white woman in her mid-30s. She has a high school diploma and works as a waitress. She's on her feet 10 hours a day. Um, and her story chronicles a long multi-generational disengagement from social institutions and an increasing sense of isolation and distrust. Bree's grandfather was a coal miner. Her mom, a waitress, died of lung cancer at 53, and her father has never been part of her life. So Bree has been married and divorced twice. She had an unplanned pregnancy at age 18 and married her son's father when her son turned four. Soon after, she says, I left him. It was rough. He was very physically abusive, so I left him and I came home. Her son's father pays no child support and is not part of their lives at all. And her daughter's father, a disabled truck driver addicted to Percocet, uh, she says has contributed $65 and two packs of meat since last November. This was in July. Um, so Bree believes that there has to be a trade-off between giving her children a nuclear family structure on one hand and then being safe and happy on the other. So she, while we're talking, she points to various spots on her body, physically mapping out her memories of trauma and violence. She says, my first husband did this to my teeth, um, pointing at the two gaps in her mouth. 
she says, he bent me over the baby's crib um, with her in it backwards. I was literally in half. She says, I don't go to the doctor for it. They want to send me to this specialist and that specialist, a psychiatrist to deal with the pain, but I don't even go. I don't even go because it doesn't even help me. It's real bad. Emotionally, I'm a mess. My, po my poor kids. At the same time, she worries, I just didn't want them to not have a father in the home with the same last name. I think I was in the mindset for my children, I'll stick it out. No one ever really taught me how to be a real woman. When Bree's electricity was shut off last year, she and her kids slept on her cousin's pullout coach for three weeks while she saved up enough money to turn the heat back on. And she says angrily, there's just nothing left here for our kids. They took French away. They cut back on the music program, the arts program. They used to have a skate bus that ran from the police station on Friday nights, but now there's nothing for these children. And she denounces the lack of mobility for struggling families. She says, you just don't keep poor people under your boot and leave them there and throw them scraps. You need to lift them up, teach them things, educate them, get them to work or something. You're killing me. So chronic anxiety and a racking cough from 20 years of Newport menthols keeps Bree up late into the night. She says, I always have a bad feeling something awful is coming, plaguing my soul. But she staunchly also refuses to see a doctor. She says, I'm so afraid of what he'll say to me. I know it's not going to be good, so I'm putting it off. The local doctor's the one who diagnosed my mom with the flu when she had lung cancer. That's why they didn't know she had cancer till she was stage three, because he was like, here's a Z-pack. It's an open secret in this area that a prescription for Percocet costs $50 in cash. And if the doctor who Bree calls the biggest drug dealer in the county knows your family, you can just call in your request over the phone. Um, and Bree has slowly stopped attending church and other kinds of social engagements. Um, she says, my church is closed soon because there's no people left. Nobody takes their kids there anymore. She says, everyone got older, the kids moved away, people died, and now I would say we get 15 people on a good day. And she takes for granted the extreme fragility of community and family bonds. She tells me, last night I posted on Facebook, trust no one ever. My mother sat me down at the age of eight, said, trust no man, don't trust your family. The only person you can trust is me. Don't trust your father. Never trust anybody, ever, ever, ever. And she was right. So the political scientist uh, Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone demonstrated how Americans have become increasingly distrustful and disconnected from each other over the last um, third of the 20th century. And central to his thesis is the idea of social capital, which is defined as connections among individuals, uh, social networks, norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness that arise from them. And you know, like human capital or physical capital, social capital also has value. Um, it can increase productivity and well-being and efficiency of individuals and groups. And Putnam argues that social capital enables information flows, norms of reciprocity and mutual aid, and also collective action by fostering a sense of a broader we. But in Bree's story, we can see how the ties between people have eroded, dissolving the basic tissues of social life. So she's detached from mainstream civic institutions. She sees the world as hostile and broken, leaving nothing larger than herself to believe in. And she's raising her children in a space of turbulent social relationships, gloomy economic prospects, and social unmooring. So today, as many scholars have demonstrated, highly educated people are more likely to marry, less likely to divorce, uh, more likely to have children within marriage, and more likely to wait to have a family until they are stable. Um, and in turn, their children benefit from their parents' stability across a wide range of health, education, and relationship outcomes. Uh, among low educated and low income Americans, um, in contrast, a child's parents may never have been married or connected to each other. And these transformations in family structure over the last uh, half century are strongly tied to rising inequality and also children's mobility prospects. And if we also look beyond the family, we see lower income youth are also increasingly disconnected and isolated outside. So disengaged from sports, from extracurricular activities, from churches and from mentors. 
Um, so my research is not really about policy implementation, so I'm kind of cheating up here. Uh, but instead, I have spent nearly a decade conducting in-depth interviews with hundreds of struggling families across the US. And my main contribution to this poly dis policy discussion on strengthening families, I would say, would be to help understand how lower income families view their relationships with each other and with the major institutions of American life. So in my conversations with them, I document what it means to them to have a good life and also how they explain their obstacles they face and their failures. And I think we first have to understand how disadvantaged people view family work and civic engagement, which are key institutions for escaping poverty if we want to build effective solutions. Um, I think people's perspectives through interviews or focus groups can provide crucial insights into the demographic patterns we observe through survey data. And by bringing in disadvantaged people's own accounts, of their lives, we can understand the mechanisms that connect culture to behavior. And uh, you know, well-connected policies, I think, could fail to reach or appeal to certain populations if we make assumptions without talking to them about what motivates their behavior. Um, to give one example, uh, this is about poverty and family formation and relationships uh, from Doing the Best I Can, Fatherhood in the Inner City by Eden and Nelson. So in, in this work, they venture into the life worlds of 110 unmarried fathers um, in New Jersey and Philadelphia, so two places with very high rates of non-marital childbearing. Um, and Eden and Nelson try to move beyond this label of deadbeat dads and understand the context in which low-income men and women create families. Um, like most aspects of their lives, uh, low-income men and women experience intimacy as unplanned and unpredictable. Uh, men describe their romantic relationships in vague language, like being together rather than love or commitment. Um, and most kind of families start somewhere in between a casual hookup and a partnership for life. Um, and so, what they find is that finding out their partner is pregnant actually transforms men. So they see the birth of a child as opportunity for redemption from personal failures, from painful histories, from broken families and communities. Um, so one young man in the book, when he hears his girlfriend is pregnant, says, I've done something good for the first time ever because the imagined alternative to having a child is not college or a good job, but incarceration or addiction or death. Um, but, you know, the shared desire to give this child a better life um, really doesn't provide enough of a bond to persist through the trials of raising an infant among precarious work and fragile ties and dangerous neighborhoods. For mothers, having a baby signifies instant adulthood, and so she also has higher expectations of her partner. Uh, but low-income men tend to react to these expectations with confusion and vulnerability and anger. So the sudden change in women's expectations may be read as betrayal, evidence that she's lacking in commitment, willing to throw him over if he can't meet her demands. Um, and so going forward, kind of as these men and women, women cycle through new relationships, each new pregnancy sort of seems like a chance to turn their life around. So being a father to this baby, they say, is a saintly calling in an evil, chaotic world. And one relationship he hasn't screwed up yet. And the larger community, which maybe a few decades ago would have demanded marriage or commitment, I think can intensify the distrust and betrayal, right? So warning people against getting married um, or seeing marriage as a trap. Um, in my own field work, I've recently talked to low-income women who are raising children alone, um, and they have told me that getting legally married would make them worse off or actually jinx what little stability they had. So one uh, younger woman told me, I'm waiting till I'm ready. I'm not ready to have someone else's last name. I mean, I love him, but the way I see it, it's like, why do that? Waste money on buying dresses and buying all this stuff if it's not going to work out. And another woman told me, I've seen so many marriages fail. I will never ever, no matter what. I could be madly in love, but I would never. And I feel like it's all about money too. You pay so much to get married and then you fight. 
And when the low-income people in the coal region I interviewed talk about their larger community, they express fierce distrust and a sense that staying to themselves is necessary for survival. So a 36-year-old white man named Roger, who was out of work trying to get disability, told me, I very rarely trust anyone because every time I started trusting someone, something happened. He says, Stone Cold Steve Austin said it on wrestling, and he put it in three letters, DTA, don't trust anyone. Uh, to provide another example, a Hispanic woman named Daniela, who is unmarried and raising three children, says, I may believe in God, but I believe we're on our own. I'm living for my children. I don't care what's going on in the world. If the world's going to end, it's going to end. We can't do nothing but stay to ourselves." And finally, a white woman named Rachel, who works part-time as a home health aide, who's raising her child with a boyfriend that she just doesn't really see as marriage material, told me, trust has to be earned, but it's tough. I think that's just because in my life and the things I've been through and seen, it's hard to trust people. I've been effed over a lot. So I think to try to move this discussion into policy, there is a strong case to be made for critical material support in terms of helping these struggling families. Um, but I also think that lack of material resources is a related but different problem than lack of strong relationships and social capital and also trust. So the disconnection and distrust among the low-income people in other people's work and in my own suggests that uh, there's a space for supports that go beyond meeting people's needs or even investing in workers and also, but also pulling them back into relationships and pulling them into communities. So that connection and trust and community accountability are not just sort of add-ons, but maybe central to strengthening families and communities and also leading to upward mobility. Um, and I think we could think about how to build community strength and resilience uh, rather than isolation and distrust, but we could think about how we could be intentional about that as a productive strategy and a desired end. Um, some of the things I thought of that might emerge from the strategy of trying to build connected relationships um, and trust could be wraparound programs that sort of act as airbags to children who, you know, home visits by trained professionals who could help families cope with health problems or child rearing or stress, kind of coaching of parents. Um, and, you know, maybe think about encouraging secular and religious organizations, soccer leagues or churches to actively engage less educated Americans who are much less likely to be involved in those groups uh, from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, let's see, so if you don't take anything else away from my talk this morning, the most important thing you should take away is nothing that I say up here reflects the views of the Joint Economic Committee, <laughs> Senator Mike Lee, or the Social Capital Project. Um, disclaimer uh, set aside. Um, so I'm going to talk about policies to promote investment in social capital. I fear that's over-promising a little bit. This became sort of a more discursive uh, presentation, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so what is social capital? I think. Everyone in the room probably has a sense of like, oh, social capital. It, it turns out this is sort of one of the most poorly and inconsistently defined concepts out there, I think, and researchers that have really dug into, you know, what is social capital are not even sure there's, there's really a there there. But um, I would argue there is. Um, social capital are assets, the assets that are constituted by and embedded in our relationships that provide value to us. So capital, just like physical capital is a stock, uh, social capital is a stock of something that provides a flow of resources to us. Uh, capital is productive, just like physical capital or financial capital is. It gives us things that we value. Um, and it's social in that aspects of our relationships uh, can provide more or less value to us, um, any number of, of things that we get from our relationships. Um, okay, so here's disappointing slide one. Uh, what do we know about the importance of social capital? Not much, it turns out. Um, why? Uh, well, because establishment causality is very difficult. Um, few people uh, do it uh, super persuasively if they don't have a randomized uh, experiment. Um, measuring something corresponding to social capital uh, is very hard uh, because uh, it, it's this concept you can't see or touch, obviously. Uh, at the Social Capital Project, we've created indices at the state and county levels 
um, which combine a bunch of things that sort of hang together and correlate together uh, pretty consistently. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, social capital is, is sort of a, an abstract concept. Um, uh, however, all that said, there's a clear logic and intuition to the idea that our relationships are valuable. Um, and so to some extent we can move Forward, I would argue, as policymakers, um, with with trying to promote social capital, even though the research on it, I think, is is actually surprisingly weak. Um, there's some stuff on health uh, that shows that people who are who are more isolated or lonely uh, have worse health outcomes. Uh, some of that's done pretty well, um, but but all in all, there's uh, there's a real dearth of of good studies out there. So just to to sort of um, make some of these more general points a little bit more specific. Um, we can use the example of the family structure, family stability literature, uh, which is vast, um, and which pretty consistently shows that the children of single mothers do worse than the children of married parents on just about everything. Um, so when you get hundreds and hundreds of studies that, that find the this, this same thing, um, it's, it's sort of tempting, I think, to say we've got rock solid evidence on this. I suspect we'll, we'll have disagreements on the panel maybe even about uh, how rock solid it is. Um, and, and there are good theoretical reasons to think that growing up with a single parent is disadvantageous. Um, uh, lower incomes, greater expenses, uh, worse parenting, uh, psychological impact on kids, uh, worse social capital, um, all good theoretical reasons to think that growing up with two parents uh, would be better than, than growing up with one. Um, and therefore, um, even though I'm gonna argue you know, the, re the research isn't as strong as we think, um, there's still a logic and an intuition towards generally mo wanting more kids growing up with married parents rather than, rather than fewer. Um, so the problem with, with all, all the hundreds of studies out there is that generally we don't know the counterfactual. Um, certainly Jennifer's uh, case study, um, you know, if you ask yourself, uh, would it be better for her, for her children if she had married uh, their father? Uh, far from obvious. Um, so it fundamentally, uh, and, and so we don't know what would have happened if single parents, for instance, had stayed together. Um, it, and fundamentally, it depends on how they might have been induced to stay together, right? There's not different, different ways to convince people not to separate or to, or, to, uh, or to get together in the first place will affect different people. Um, and so you can't even really talk about the single effect of growing up with, uh, with a single, single parent, for instance. Um, and the outcomes of children of married parents can't be presumed to be the same as the outcomes of children of single parents if their parents had gotten or stayed married. Um, that's sort of a fundamental uh, challenge, I think, in the research in this area, is how do you model the counterfactual for kids of single parents with kids of married parents? Very difficult to do. You have to control for things like, uh, you know, have satisfaction with the, with the relationship. Um, so conditional unsatisfaction with the relationship, uh, you know, do, do kids of single parents do worse? Um, also, uh, what would have happened if um, married parents had not stayed together is a slightly different question that we hardly ever ask. Um, and that raises these other issues. You know, how, how would we have prevented uh, you know, a happily married couple from, uh, from staying together? Um, you, you would need some sort of perverse uh, inducement for that. Um, and again, that the inducement would affect different people. Uh, it's entirely possible that the children of married parents would do worse if their mostly satisfied parents were induced to separate, while children of single parents would do worse if their mostly dissatisfied parents were induced to stay or get together. Um, and then finally, uh, what, what would have happened if a child producing relationship leading to single parenthood never produced a child? So this is also a question that doesn't really get asked nearly enough, I think, in academia or in, in policy making. Um, what if the counterfactual uh, to, to growing up with a single parent isn't growing up with married parents, it's not being born, right? And then in your place, uh, at least some of the time, uh, so another child would have been born uh, to uh, one of the parents, but maybe not the other parent, maybe, maybe to, to both of the, the same parents. Um, and, and then the question is, how would that kid uh, do versus the kid who actually was born and, and raised in a single parent family? Um, I should say with all this, you know, we're speaking in terms of averages, um, I uh, am a half-time uh, single dad myself, uh, blending, um, so none of this is meant to, uh, to sort of be uh, un unduly negative towards, uh, towards single parents. Okay, so more generally, um, if, we, if we sort of abstract from the family structure stuff, um, it just might not be possible to overcome uh, the selection and omitted variable bias problems uh, in assessing the effects of other forms of social capital. Um, so anytime somebody 
Uh, any, anytime something we're studying depends on decision making, uh, parents deciding whether or not to stay together or not, um, we have to assume that our, as researchers, our methods actually give us more information uh, about what the best thing for them to do is than they actually have themselves, which is a pretty high, pretty high bar, I think, uh, for researchers to, to have. Um, and it's pro probably not even sensible to consider average effects. You need specific instruments, uh, to use uh, academic language, um, uh, that exogenously affect family structure and specific people, uh, in which case you can estimate these late effects, a local average treatment effect, uh, more on identification strategies than you probably bargained for, um, but about as much as I can give, I think. Um, okay, on that happy note, uh, uh, what is the evidence that, 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 what's some evidence that social capital uh, is important for outcomes? Um, I think the best single study that's been done uh, on the family structure literature is this one by McClanahan, Tack, and uh, Daniel Sch Schneider um, from a few years ago. It, it sort of confines itself to the most methodologically sophisticated uh, studies, uh, which I also think are, are, are still not really up to the task of, of answering this question well, but it, but it certainly does a better job, I think, than any, any other place of focusing on the best, the best studies and what they say. And they say that, uh, that growing up with, uh, with two parents is generally better than, than growing up with, with one parent. Um, uh, the Chetty Research Project, uh, the Equality of Opportunity Project, has uh, produced some really uh, great um, correlation, uh, mostly correlative uh, evidence. Um, on the importance of social capital, so they use this um, social capital index from Penn State, um, and they show that that is very strongly related to their economic mobility measures. Um, Chetty, when he presents his stuff to, to general audiences, he sort of highlights five uh, things that he wants people to take away, and social capital is always one of the five that he talks about. Uh, another one that he always talks about is, um, is concentrated single parenthood. Um, that has some of the biggest correlations uh, with, with mobility of anything in his, in his research. Um, and it's interesting because he finds that living in a place, living in a commuting zone with more single parents uh, worsens kids' mobility even if they grew up with married parents. So you can interpret that one of two ways. Uh, one way is that, wow, have, single parenthood is really damaging even to kids who don't grow up in the family. Or you can interpret it as, as indicating selection, that there's something else going on in these uh, commuting zones that have uh, high rates of single parenthood, um, that even the kids there who don't have high rates of single parenthood, or even, even the kids there who are living with married parents are doing worse too. Um, so it leaves a lot of room for uh, multiple interpretations. Um, he has some really interesting stuff on concentrated fatherlessness in his, in his recent paper on race, uh, where he does this really neat thing where he shows that the share of married black fathers in an area uh, is correlated with the mobility of black men, but not white men, um, and the shares of white uh, married, fa married fathers uh, correlates with the mobility of white men, but not black men. Um, and so it's a really interesting argument about, you know, cons constrained uh, social networks, um, but some relationships being more important than others, but these effects being more than just uh, kind of simple, simple effects. And then he has this really important moving to opportunity uh, reanalyses, um, which, which is based on a randomized uh, control trial, and I think is, is probably some of his strongest evidence that he has. I think everybody knows moving to opportunity was um, this uh, policy experiment uh, that uh, moved a bunch of people from poor neighborhoods into uh, non-poor neighborhoods, um, gave them vouchers to do that. Uh, and then for years, everybody was disappointed uh, in how minimal most of the effects were. There were some positive effects on health, um, perceived safety, things like that, but the academic outcomes were not there. The, uh, the parents' economic outcomes were not there, so most people were disappointed by it. Uh, in, in comes uh, Chetty and his team, um, and they find that in adulthood, they're actually more likely to have enrolled in college and uh, more likely uh, have, have higher earnings um, than the people who were not, uh, who didn't get the voucher. Um, so pretty solid evidence there, I think, that uh, for the idea that neighborhoods uh, in some way are important, um, in some way that correlates with poverty, but may or may not have to do with, with income. Um, and then finally, uh, I have to publicize uh, the Social Capital Project uh, that I run. Um, in May, we built this uh, social capital index, um, and we have a, a number of sub-indices as well, family health, community health, institutional health. Some of them are thinner than others. Uh, there's not a lot of county-level data out there. 
Uh, a fair amount of state data out there, though. Uh, and we show in, in our report from earlier this year, we just correlate it with about 50 different benchmarks, things that you would guess that social capital probably uh, affects, and, and the correlations are, are generally pretty high. Um, and so we're hoping that people will use the index and uh, use our data and do um, more clever, sophisticated stuff than, uh, than what we've done so far. Okay, policies, I proposed, I said I was gonna give policies. Um, so here are some policies. Uh, so you, you can uh, imagine uh, trying to promote marriage. Um, so you have marriage promotion and fatherhood programs. Um, I think we're gonna hear more about uh, a specific marriage promotion program uh, next. Um, generally, these have been pretty disappointing. Um, I think the best one was in Oklahoma and there it didn't actually increase marriage. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we haven't had a ton of luck there. There's a private initiative called the Culture of Freedom uh, Initiative that um, the Philanthropy Roundtable uh, has sponsored that, that, that is claiming gigantic effects in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, but I don't think they've published anything rigorous on it yet. Um, and I believe there's a military uh, program that actually has shown pretty solid effects. Um, but I don't know details on that. Uh, dealing with marriage disincentives and tax and transfer programs, I think, would be uh, a, a, a real key uh, policy change that we could pursue. It's expensive because uh, you're you're paying instead of just instead of uh, you're inducing people to stick together because they're going to both get benefits. Um, whereas right now there's a penalty, and their pen their benefits get reduced if they if they stay together. Um, you could do marriage incentives. So I've proposed something. Um, uh, an expansion of the child tax credit. Um, so it would not reduce uh, the child tax credit for uh, kids of single parents, but it would expand it quite a bit for the kids of married parents. Um, and the goal there would be to try to, at the margin, convince some people who you know, are uh, more or less responsible in terms of thinking about what are the consequences of me doing this right now, uh, given my current circumstances, versus if I, if I am more careful and wait, um, perhaps you know I'm going to get this large financial financial reward. This is kind of what we learned, I think. I think from uh, the welfare to work experiments was that uh, it wasn't so much teaching the soft skills and and trying to uh, to sort of manipulate things on the ground uh, that worked. It was more the earned income tax credit, like was this shining uh, light that said like if you work, you're gonna you're gonna be better off in a lot of cases. So maybe try it with the child tax credit as well. Um, I didn't put it on here, but you could certainly add, uh, Bell made me think of this, um, you, could, uh, you could add uh, expanding access to, um, uh, to contraception, effective contraception, long-acting reversible contraception in LARCs. Um, I'm skeptical of sort of what the demand is for, uh, for LARCs, but, uh, but it would clearly help a bunch of people. Um, parenting programs. Uh, youth mentoring programs is a great one thread that's getting a lot of attention uh, that John Hopkins folks are doing in Baltimore, I think. Um, uh, there's a great program called the Urban Alliance that my fiance may uh, be uh, running. Um, the uh, safety net reforms to encourage work, um, moving to opportunity uh, type programs. So both moving from poor neighborhoods to non-poor neighborhoods, but also you can imagine if you made it easier for people to move uh, to opportunity, meaning across states, across regions of the country. Um, if Texas is booming, how can we get more people to go to Texas? Um, uh, moving opportunity back would be a different strategy, trying to uh, provide incentives for uh, people, the sort of folks who leave uh, when the state experiences brain drain to come back to the community. Um, that would be another way to rebuild social capital. Uh, school choice, um, change the, the social environment of kids who want to do well in school but are, are stuck in uh, failing schools. Um, public support for social infrastructure, um, I, I think, is interesting, Eric Kleinenberg of NYU has this new book, uh, Palaces for the People, uh, which I've not read, but which looks very good. Um, and he argues that we need to invest more in social infrastructure, things like libraries, parks, common areas where people congregate, um, playgrounds, uh, and that that's, those are the kind of places where we build social capital. Um, and so uh, if we invested more in some of those places, both publicly and privately, um, that, that we'd be in better shape. Uh, leveraging local institutions and program administration. This is you know, something like Paul Ryan's um, opportunity grant proposal from a few years back that uh, probably a bunch of you don't like. Um, but the, the logic behind it is people on the ground uh, have more information about what their, uh, what their folks need um, than bureaucrats uh, here in DC, no offense. Um, <laughs> 
I think, I think a lot of bureaucrats would actually agree, agree with that as well uh, from having talked to several of them. Um, and then there's this idea of federal, uh, a federalism of subsidiarity, which is my phrase, I'm not quite sure I like, but uh, the idea is essentially, and, and Senator Lee does believe this very much, I think, that the federal government has just gotten involved in too many things. Um, and, and local communities have sort of lost the muscles that they have uh, to, to sort of uh, invest in social capital locally. Um, if we sort of cede everything to the federal government, um, then these muscles atrophy, uh, and, and moreover, um, the stakes of federal policy become really high, witness Supreme Court nomination, for instance, um, and so it's fueling political polarization, which is kind of a, a, a di and social polarization, which is sort of a different social capital problem as well. But so, so giving more to the states and, and to localities, um, as long as there was a, a, a federal role uh, around things like uh, you know, making sure that poor states have enough to, to deal with poverty, for instance, um, uh, evaluating different approaches that states are taking um, would be useful too, I think. I will end there. Hi, uh, my name is Haidar Kerwin. I'm from Howard University. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, a project that we have been doing with my, some of my co-authors. Um, ben Weshmutz is in Paris now, he moved to uh, Europe. And Rodney Green uh, from Howard, who is retired now, I guess, and I'm the only one left here, but we're still working on this project. This project was interesting because it's, it's data. The data is very interesting because they're randomized experiments. And, and we are kind of revisiting this, 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 this data that you know, sociologists and other social scientists, they worked a lot. And, and we feel like um, you, know, it's, uh, you can learn a lot about the participants and what they think about you know, relationships, marriages. Uh, so, um, but we kind of take a different uh, take on this. So uh, these are, everybody probably in this room, you know, they're familiar with this data sets, uh, building strong families, and, and supporting a healthy marriage. Uh, we are working on two, two in both, both, both data sets, but right, today I'm gonna mostly talk about the building strong families and, and, and what we found, what is their impacts. So the, you know, their goals were to improve quality and durability of the relationship between you know, future parent, parents. The parents in the BSF family, they are not married, so that's kind of you know, the good one. And then you can kind of see that, you know, whether they're gonna marry you or not at the end of it. So these are random, randomized experiments. Uh, the design allowed researchers to assess, you know, the program's impacts. Uh, these are 15 months and longer, so you can kind of look at that. Um, so overall, what the literature found is that, you know, this program did not have much significant quantitative impacts on, uh, on, on relationship and education outcomes. So for, for, the, for them, for their kids. <coughs> so, so the reason for that was uh, because of the data issue and because of the methods that the researchers they used. Usually, they kind of uh, construct these uh, indices of marriage stability or something else. That is basic. What you do is that you look at the answers to many questions and you construct this index and you call it, you know, marriage stability or or something else. But the problem is that. Um, it kind of magnifies data problems because if you know, let's say, 10% of the you know participants did not respond, you know, 10 of those questions, at the end you are going to have a huge problem, uh, and then that's what they do is that you know the researchers mostly they do imputations, which has its own problems because you're kind of you know you're a little bit you know you're losing the the accuracy of the data and there's a huge huge problem. So what we did is that we want to see what were the experiences of you know, the participants? And we just focused on four questions. So remember that the data, you know, the study, uh, first you know, gets uh, applicants and then randomly you know, put them in treatment group and the control group. So, and then before, in the, basis, in the base model, before they participate, they ask them, are you married? And then at the end of the program, are you, are you married? So, so then we can see 
you know, how the marriage changed. And they had the similar questions, you know, were uh, you romantically involved on a steady basis? So the, we, this is, we call it relationship quality. And, and then there's another question, uh, strongly agree that it's better for a couple to be married and to just live together. So this kind of um, va value about marriage or relationship. So this is kind of, and, and the last question is, it's better for children if their parents are married. So this is kind of four questions that we look at it. So, and, and the, the advantage of doing like this, you kind of, you know, you can look at the marriage status, the first question, the second one, the relationship quality. We don't have to, you know, find any kind of indices. And this kind of, you know, interesting, you know, question that can measure something. And the other one is the value, right? I mean, what people think about this, you know? Because remember, we asked them, the, in, the, they asked the questions initially and after the program, so we can see what changed. And then the, 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 the number four is belief. Um, so what did we find? Um, what did we find? Basically, the program appears to have positive impacts on marriage quality. So which means that, you know, those participated, they agree that, yeah, you know, it's kind of, you know, they agree on the first qu this question. Marriage quality was, uh, you know, the, the I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I misspoke, so relationship quality. Romantically involved on a steady basis. So they you know, romance improved. So this should be relationship status. This results, so, ba so but they, the, the basic, the program did not increase the percentage of the people who married. So because, as you know, people have been talking about marriage, you know, s the whole day, it's an indicator of something else. You know, is there some other uh, condi some some other st conditions has to be ripe, you know, for people to to marry. It's not about values or or other things. So this is such that the program may have changed couples' opinions, but not necessarily their behaviors. In other words, they did not get married. I mean, they are, you know, okay. Uh, so after all, the program did not increase the likelihood of getting married among the treatment groups. So this was the impact. So that's why what other studies, they found it. You know, it did not lead to more marriages. Okay, so, so how did we do that? Let me just talk a little bit about our methodology. So basically, so to investigate whether the program changed couples' values on marriage, we focus on the yes or no responses, right, to the people, so this question. Strongly agree that it's better for a couple to be married than just to live together. So this is in the 15-month uh, statements. So what we found that mothers rather than fathers change their values after they are treated. Uh, other studies, mostly they, what they use is that they, um, uh, they looked at you know, at least one person's response. So what we do is that now we want to make sure that the couples also agree on a question. So that's why we do separately and then we look at the couples. So the coefficient of treatment dummy, which means that those who were in the program who were being trained on the relationship, is significant and positive in uh, mothers only regression and in couples level regression, where at least one member of the couple provides yes response. So this is, you know, this is kind of good. So with this is, so, and I'm gonna talk about later on, this, this result is not, uh, is, is not you know, surprising if, if you look at other randomized you know, studies in the area of economics, let's say the job training programs or enterprise zones, uh, so basically, people who wants to be trained, who wants to participate, they participate. But why they want to participate? Why they want to be trained? Because of the other condition. This doesn't mean that personality, personal characters are important. I'll, I'm going to talk about that, you know, um, later on. So, did the program change the values about marriage, or those with stronger beliefs responded more? So, in other words, you know, if you thinking about something, marriage, after you've been trained in the program. Are you, do you feel stronger now? Uh, so again, we look at yes and no responses to it's better for children if their parents are married. Statements are converted to one and zero, so we did that. So this is called the belief variable. Marriage values is regressed on, the tr on, on treatment dummy variable and initial belief variable. Uh, okay, so initially, you know, before you come to the program, you know, what you're thinking and then we kind of control for that. So the coefficient of treatment variable is significant and positive in mothers only regression and in couples level regression. So which is, you know, pretty good. So the program had some impact, right? It's basically, you know, we got, and we got some information uh, from the participants. Um, so, so the program did not have a significant and positive impact on those provided zero answer to better for children if their parents are married question. So the couples with stronger initial belief on marriage gained more from the program. 
Okay, so those think that yes, it should be right. They now they, they now they even they, they believe stronger. The program did not change behavior, or even they believe in the relationship quality. So this is, you know, what we found. So this result is also consistent with the outcome of the randomized experiments carried out in other areas of economics, including workforce training programs and enterprise zones programs. Now, this is, um, um, so this is not surprising, as I said before. Now, but why not now, the, if, when we look at the literature in the job training program on enterprise zones, mm -hmm. now we have, um, you know, the, the success of the participant in a job training program is based on the individual characteristics and also about the local economy. So local economy, I mean, how the economy, so, so this is uh, what is this geography of opportunity, this is also kind of showing that. If you are in a place that the job market, you know, the job market is not good, right, and you somehow, you are not uh, connected to, you know, the, you are not connected to the, um, to, 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 to the jobs, you might not be participate in the training program. Or you might participate, but because of the, you know, the, the local economic conditions, uh, you might not find, find the jobs. So, and this will be the outcome. So now, and similarly for the enterprise zones, enterprise zones are very interesting programs because basically that you try to locate, you try to support a local business in some areas. And so, um, and, the, and the, the, the way you do is that, you know, and some of them are successful, some of them are not. So again, the success in the, in, in the case of the enterprise zones is based on you know, how the, 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 the local businesses and how that lo locality is functioning in the national economy, in the regional economy. And if you are enforcing these linkages, you know, those, those, those uh, linkages, then the business might, surprise, might, 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 uh, might, might uh, be successful. And some R's are not. And again, we see the same thing, right? And when we do the randomized experiments, people did on those businesses, what you found, the same thing. That is, yes, people are willing to you know, participate, willing to do that, but success is, is something else. It is beyond the participants or the businesses' control. Uh, but for the, uh, now the, since the success depend, depends on, 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 on the forces that the beyond the individuals, you know, uh, uh, control, uh, we have some, some, some indicators in the economy, right, that we can see how the economy businesses are doing. The businesses are, li are, are linked together through the, you know, buying and supplying. In the GDP accounting, we can, you know, measure which businesses are buying from what, so we can kind of measure those relationships. And those relationships, and there are indicators about how the consumers, you know, feel about the economy, how the businesses are doing. But we do not have any indicator, anything like this on the relationship. We just have these programs, right? They just say that, you know, you just do something about people. But how, as what, you know, as Jennifer was saying, that about talking about this, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, in this, uh, single mom, uh, mothers and their experiences, how they are doing as the economy changes. Because we do have, you know, indicators, we have measures about businesses about how they are doing, how they are, 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 are performing uh, over the economy. So, um, so the, um, now the, uh, if the, if, if, if the, the, the success, uh, so now there is a lot of studies are done about the businesses, right? I mean, Bartik is one of them. He, talk, he, do, he did a lot of religious, uh, studies about, and the surveys about, the, the success of local economic, local and state economic uh, government's policies. Which part programs, you know, they are successful, which ones are not. And again, the, here he brings to this issue of, you know, uh, again and again, the issue of the local economic conditions. And in other words, the geography, the access to jobs, and you know, access to, you know, transportation, access to, you know, other things, right? And these are, and since the regions are different, the economies are different, and uh, having a, just a similar programs across the states, across the places, might not be successful. Um, similarly, uh, I would like to talk about, you know, about my own research that we did um, uh, uh, with Joe Persky and, and, and Ryan Gallagher in Chicago about the Chicago schools. So we, we measured the extent of the size of the, the redistribution that is going on in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the local school distribution the districts. 
So we focused on the Chicago suburbs. And in three uh, publications that we made, successfully we found this. There is a redistribution going on within the local uh, the jurisdictions. And we measured that. The size is huge. In Chicago, it was like $3.2 billion. In other words, and this redistribution was going on between the, the parents that do, had, do not have kids in the public schools to those that they have. In Chicago suburbs, about one third of the only one third of the parents, you know, they have kids in the Chicago schools. So, so which, uh, and, and if, if we kind of, either way we talk, think about this problem at the federal, or local, or state levels, there is a redistribution going on, and so the question is that, uh, to, from whom to whom? So, and, the, um, and the, the other thing is that, you know, we looked at the elderly who do not have the kids in the public schools, and why don't they move? And they just, you know, some, it's usually, you know, people stay in the neighborhoods, they don't move that much, which is kind of, you know, something that against the economics and you know, assumptions. So I think these examples, it shows the size of the redistribution, and these programs can be, now we have to think about how can include more people to this. Because this redistribution that is going on within the suburbs, other places, is mostly from, you know, uh, similar, you know, groups of homogeneous groups. Um, and that's why this moving to opportunity, although research shows that it didn't have much impact, but these are important, right? So how can we, you know, include this, you know, uh, more people from different backgrounds, you know, more citizens to this, uh, you know, uh, economic opportunities? That, and this, most of the opportunities, remember, they exist because these neighborhoods are sharing their resources through local taxes. Um, and so the designing the policy, one thing, the other is in that given the, you know, the, the existing institutions, uh, how can we, you know, move people to the opportunity? This would be uh, one of them. So this is, a, uh, I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much. So we're going to go ahead uh, <clears throat> almost right now and do q and A. I I just wanted to make, uh, I guess, three quick comments in response to the panel um, to just sort of underline, you know, I think three different points. One is obviously that um, in terms of addressing issues of uh, poverty, um, intergenerational immobility, um, and family dysfunction, I think that um, Professor Silva's comments suggest, you know, that economic policies can be helpful, but are certainly not the only thing that sort of needs to take place if we're really going to make headway. And so I think it requires us to think about sort of non-governmental ways, you know, to address um, some of the challenges now facing, you know, many poor and working class communities across uh, the country. Um, in response to Scott's comments, I think, you know, on the one hand, you were kind of discounting some of the research on uh, marriage and family structure for kids, and then you were kind of proposing that we should do more to promote marriage um, and stable families. Um, and I'm obviously more supportive of the latter comments than the former comments. Um, although I think it's important to announce just on, on the former point that there is new research um, done by economists like Joe Price instrumenting, for instance, the sex of the first child and using that as a way to figure out how a external factor, in this case, having a boy seems to uh, induce marriage um, and greater family stability and other economic outcomes. That's, that's one way that they're tackling this sort of methodological challenge. And there's also, of course, more and more twin studies, too. They're looking at the impact of marriage both on children, so looking at parents um, who are twins and where one twin is getting divorced, one twin is not getting divorced, and seeing how the kids, you know, fare in the wake of that, so to try to address the genetic confounds. Um, so there's, uh, there's more and more research, I think, that might meet your methodological bar, you know, to sort of back up the, the, the second half of your um, comments. Um, and then in terms of um, Professor Kribon's comments, I, I appreciate just the, the idea that we need to think about outcomes, you know, beyond just uh, family structure, but also outcomes in terms of just of the normative climate, um, for couples and I would add for communities. So with those quick comments, let me now turn to uh, the audience and let you 
um, raise questions that you might have for our panel uh, today. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Um, I'm from Utah, so families are incredibly important in our state, um, as they are everywhere, but um, they take on a different <laughs> view there. Um, and we're doing extensive research on intergenerational poverty and um, know that about 62% of the children living there are living in single parent households. And I understand the idea of promoting marriage, but it's very nearly impossible to say to families you have to get married at this stage. And I'm just wondering, and the evidence on marriage pro programs to promote marriage are not very compelling. And I just wonder if through any of your research, um, you've looked at um, outcomes for, for children um, outside of marriage where both parents, including the non-custodial parent, are actively engaged in the relationships with their children and um, maybe starting to think that we need to promote healthy relationships and active engagement of parents outside of marriage in addition to promoting long-term bringing the institution of marriage back. So I'm just wondering if you've come across any of those studies. Well, speaking personally, there's plenty of work that's been done by scholars, including work done by scholars at Penn State, Paul Amato and colleagues, that suggests that, you know, when you have a, you know, relatively conflict-free, cooperative, you know, relationship between co-parents, that that can be helpful for kids. So that's certainly part of, you know, the broader message one would want to bring to these kinds of conversations. So, I mean, I would agree with that's, um, you know, certainly important. Do you want to add anything, anyone here, to that? Or, or go ahead. Uh, yes, sir, in the, or. Uh, I'm going to Jennifer's comment and mention the other one about our marriage. The trust issue, I think we might need to move out of welfare stuff and go over into psychology and do some work around uh, what M. M. Scott Peck tried to put together about community building, about developing not only individual relationships, but also community relationships. So that's way out of the place of where welfare programs have been. It's not that our daily way, but I think we may need to move over there. And the other place I think we may need to move over and get back to the whole marriage bit is that we've spent very little time in terms of what we know in terms of structural marriage and over in, I mean, get on the psychology side of the house. There's been a ton of work done with like Salvador Munchen some other people around marriage, especially for poor people, and how we get them prepared for that. I don't see any of that conversation going on. And the other one is that do women marry men who are not economically as well off as them, which may be an issue here. And does government kind of drive out poor men's ability to compete for marriage? You want to take the list? <laughs> good questions. Yeah, those are all good questions. So um, I'll just talk about what I've observed in my recent project, which is in this, it's in a declining coal region. And in, in this area, um, the jobs actually started to go away post-World War II, so kind of earlier than like other kind of working class and poor communities were hit. And, if, and it, when I read, for example, testimonies of people who lived through this, they, one of the things they talk about is how 
losing a job, the men would lose their coal mining jobs, and then the women went to work in the garment factories. And men would testify that it was degrading to them and demeaning to them, um, that they weren't the ones working. And then it actually dovetailed with increasing suicide and alcoholism. Um, and then as people started out migrating, then um, the, there were 12 churches in this area, and it was condensed to two. And so I think it is psychological and structural at the same time, like working back. But I, I do think that in terms of fixing the problem, you would have to focus also on restoring trust. And the only places I've seen that in my research would be at actually like support groups for people struggling with family members with addiction. And that was one of the only places where people actually shared their suffering with each other and then actually helped point each other to services that could help them. And I thought that was a really interesting way where it was extremely local because the distrust of government is so high and that the only people they would trust are people they're kind of sharing things with. Um, yeah, in the front. Uh, hi, uh, Jennifer, you talked, uh, by the way, I thought all the stuff about social capital and trust was just terrific. We really need to talk about all of that more. Uh, but I also wanted to specifically note, because this won't surprise people who know me, uh, you talked about all the unplanned pregnancies Your book is very intriguing, and I can't wait to finish it. But as a practitioner, um, first I want to thank you for mentioning family and domestic violence as a factor in economic stability. It, it truly is. Um, the thing that I liked about your book so far is the economic unstable profile. What it looks like, it, it's challenging us as practitioners. We, we think we've assumed a certain profile, and that's not necessarily what is facing us as practitioners. So you mentioned when developing policies, if we make these assumptions about this group, um, we can develop these great policies and these great programs, but they may go underutilized. Have you noticed any trends about the assumptions that practitioners are making about particular groups or other than they're not who you necessarily might have thought that the economic, um, or facing economic instability are. Did you notice anything? You may mention in your book, and I haven't finished it. Um, yeah, my work often stops right before I get to real policy. I'll be honest, I get overwhelmed <laughs> by all the problems. Um, but I mean, one thing that I have found is that um, most of the poor and working class people I've talked to over the last three years are extremely critical of inequality and they're really critical of government and politicians who they think did not protect them from sort of vulnerability and um, don't necessarily want assistance, but they certainly want investment in their families and they actually um, think that that's a duty of the government. So that was interesting to me, just like how critical 
there were of our institutions. Um, and I think willing to listen to people who had um, suggestions for change. Work training or education. Um, like they wanted to get people to invest in them, um, restoring the ability to have a good job. And just as a side note, both Bell Sahil's new book and Orrin Cass's new book are making kind of a similar argument, and that is that we focus so much on kind of the, on providing support to poor and vulnerable people, but in reality, it's a real push on their uh, from their perspective to look more towards education and work. They don't want to be dependent; they want to be independent, but they need some you know policies to do that for them. But next question. Yeah, Peter Rossi. Rossi's law, uh, yeah. that essentially uh, most uh, social programs will fail if they're cold. Uh, I think that's true, but I also think we need to uh, keep swinging, essentially, that we should just uh, invest a lot of money in, in a lot of local experiments, uh, knowing that 80% of them are going to fail, um, and hopefully find some, some things that work that we can, that we can generalize. Um, this culture of freedom initiative, uh, you know, it, it has not been rigorously evaluated at all. Um, I will be talking to the people who started it and uh, who are very big on it. Um, but they have a theory that the reason that the marriage promotion programs didn't work, that were in the welfare reform reauthorization uh, in 02, um, was that essentially religious institutions were sort of, it was almost impossible for them to really, uh, I guess, use the strategies that they, that they would use if, if they could do anything. And so this culture of freedom initiative is really church-based. It's sort of your fellow congregants saying like, hey, there's, a, there's this great uh, discussion group meet on Sunday. Like, why don't you come? There's some cookies. And then like, you suck somebody in, and they're like, come back next week, right? And um, it's sort of a, it's, it's a theory about, um, I guess, familiarity and trust in local institutions, I guess. There could be nothing to that. <laughs> um, but that's, that's sort of one thing. That,
based on some method. So in this case, now that is like a, an indicator and has to be determined by many things. It's not just one factor. So I, I think we should learn about it, like what's going on in this you know, part of our lives. And, and then we also have to you know, consider this heterogeneity issue that you can involve in these issues. That, you know, kind of, uh, and, and if the research results are And I would just add, I think we have to think outside of the sort of the policy playbook and think about sort of the role of the culture in all this and to look at the experience we've had with um, DWI campaigns in terms of drunken driving with teen pregnancy and then to sort of realize that there's also a cultural piece that could be kind of thrown at this as well, not just sort of discrete programs designed to kind of give people discrete relationship skills. Um, because. Uh, I mean, uh, the point I'm making too is just that we live in a society where about half of Americans are successfully marrying in terms of marital stability and their kids are enjoying a lot of benefits from that and half Americans aren't. And whatever you might think about marriage as a normative issue, I, I think most folks will have to sort of acknowledge that it, it is now a major player in economic and social inequality in America. And if we live in a society where just, just the well-educated and affluent are marrying, everyone else isn't successfully and stably, and everyone else is not, that's just, that's gonna be a big part and parcel of the divides that now, you know, mark this country. So can we think more creatively about a variety of things, including public policy, but also other civic and cultural efforts to, to bridge that divide is sort of my sort of question and also sort of response to you. But one more question. Or pick, yes. Yes, my name is Romeo Abdassin from APHSA. I have a question for Scott. So, based on your research, you know, on marriages and family economic mobility, I was wondering if you ever control for the length of the marriage or the sexual orientation you know, of the participant. Um, so, I should say I have done. There are different effects on kids depending upon how long, like a breakup, you know, takes place into the to yeah. marriage and things like that. So. And I think there's very little stuff on, uh, especially kids raised by uh, by same-sex parents uh, and, and people we have in marriage, uh, for, uh, for same-sex adults uh, for a short period of time. There hasn't been enough time for a lot of divorce. So please join me in thanking our panelists and feel free to talk to them. Thank you.